things to do so that you're all prepared and ready to go. That's what we're going to talk about upstairs today. What? And food. Yes, I want lots of good food. If you were packing snacks, what would we need to pack for a trip? Yes. Oh, I would need healthy food for a snack. Oh, well, breakfast is important, yes. What else would we need food-wise? Nothing else? Yes. What did you have? Gummies. That's all you need? Just gummies and healthy food and you guys are good to go? Parents, you're getting off easy. In our house, we need licorice and chips and all sorts of stuff, yes? She wants me to pack salads to eat in my car. Oh, bless you. Yes. She wants beef sticks and beef jerky. We're getting closer. <laughs> All right, so the importance is packing. Yes, sir. Pizza. pizza. I think I would probably, I like my pizza hot. But if you can eat it cold, like that's pretty good to go too, right? The ones from Quick Trip. Do you know they don't have Quick Trips all over the country? You get to the southern part of the state, you're on your own. There's no more Quick Trips. All right, since we know that Quick Trip would keep us prepared, Let's pray so we can prepare for Sunday school. Dear God, thank you for helping prepare us for life, for reminding us that it's important to pack the things that we need, like clothes and books, and it's also important to pack snacks and sustenance to keep us going so that we have good attitudes along the way. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for Sunday school teachers and volunteers. And thank you for the voices of children that bless our worship. We give thanks for the gift of this day. In Jesus' name, the people say, Amen. Oh, Doritos are serious. OK, grab what you want. She's got them. No, we can't fight for them. She's got them. Something else. Buddy. Are any of these options that you'd be interested in? Yeah, you want to just sit here? Yeah? Do you want these? Yeah? Thanks for coming up. What a joy to be here with you in worship today. Uh, as uh, Pastor Nicole said in the introduction at the beginning of the service, uh, I'm Mary Schaller Bloffus and I serve at Eden Theological Seminary. And one of the things that I get to do in my role uh, with advancement is to connect with local congregations. Um, and so this is a joy. Uh, a team of us from Eden are in the area uh, this week uh, with some uh, conversations and programming with Lakeland University. Um, and so as we were planning that, I uh, got in touch with Pastor Nicole and said, can I come and be with you in worship today? And so uh, really appreciate uh, this kind of opportunity. Um, and also the opportunity to say publicly how proud your seminary is of you. We love you. Thank you. And I know you all do too. Why don't you give her a hand? <laughs> so our text today, all about preparing. Preparing for a trip, getting our snacks. Uh, another thing that we prepare for a lot is if we're getting ready for a wedding. And I'll tell you what, pastors have all kinds of wedding preparation stories. I'm not going to go into all those. I'm going to tell you a personal story. Uh, because when uh, I was preparing for my own wedding about <clears throat> 33 years ago, uh, 
it was a year long in the preparation. Everybody had to get their clothes just right, and we had to make sure that the extended family from both sides could all gather, and our friends from all different kinds of parts of our lives, and it was a big celebration. Lots of joy, lots of stomach flutters. And I think the stomach flutters was the most obvious in my future now brother-in-law. He had responsibility for the rings. We had the rehearsal. Everyone knew where to stand. We came in the next day, everyone was getting dressed, and Eric looked around, somebody must have said something, and apparently his face lost all color because he realized that he had left the rings sitting on his kitchen counter in his apartment that was 40 minutes away from the church. <laughs> well, his sister, bless her heart, put her kids into the care of the rest of the family and went driving off to get those rings, and she got the rings and she got back in time just to be able to put the rings in his hand as everyone was walking down the aisle. And I'll tell you, I didn't know anything like this was going on. <laughs> Our scripture today uses this image of the wedding, of the banquet, uh, as a way to tell about the glorious celebration that we anticipate being in God's presence. It is a joy that brings together different parts of our lives, different parts of the world, and is more glorious than we can ever imagine. But it takes preparation. It takes preparation to be able to see God's presence in the world and to know where we can join God in God's presence and work in the world. And so Jesus gives us this parable. He gives us a lot of parables. But in this parable, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like this. You have ten bridesmaids, and as we've been hearing, five are foolish, five are wise. And the five wise ones have plenty of oil for their lamps. Well, they're waiting. And they're waiting. And the bridegroom is not coming. And there's a delay. And they're looking around, and if in this story the bridegroom is Jesus or the bridegroom is God, then they're waiting for where God is. And what do they do? They get sleepy, and they take a nap. Those preparations matter, especially in those times when we are waiting especially in those times when life is complicated, when the world is complex. And we might want easy answers, and we might want directions, but the bridegroom is delayed. I mean, how in our world do we speak to the horrific violence that is happening even at this moment in Gaza and in Israel? It is so horrific and so complex. And how do we combat the growing anti-Semitism and Islamophobia that now has been unleashed as if it's okay to spew this? The bridegroom is delayed. Or our personal lives and our local communities, they face challenges. And it feels like we're crying out, God, how long? Are we there yet? The bridegroom is delayed. And so when in Matthew's story, the people who are waiting get tired and go to sleep, they're not really paying attention to what is going on. It's almost as if uh, a pastor friend of mine years ago uh, told me the story that when she went to go visit uh, someone in the neighborhood, she walked in the door and sitting on the kitchen table was a note that they obviously had forgotten to pick up before the pastor came. And the note said, pastor coming, dust Bible. <laughs> I 
our preparations are more than just having the dust off of our Bibles. The preparations are more than just having some kind of a surface level understanding of who we are and whose we are. The preparations take study and take exercise and practice and on and on. It's a long-term process. I am continually inspired by uh, the witnessing of Ibu Patel. Ibu is an American Muslim of Indian descent. He lives in Chicago. And he challenges us to know our stories of faith, to know our stories of faith deeply so that they can interact with each other and go even deeper. In the book that uh, I had purchased and he inscribed, he inscribed it to me saying, toward a new world together. And in that book that he calls Acts of Faith, Ibu starts with an experience that he had in high school, at the high school lunch table. If you ever doubt the importance of the high school lunch table, this may change your mind. Because in that high school uh, lunchroom, the group, he says, that he ate with included a Cuban Jew, a Nigerian evangelical, and an Indian Hindu. He says, we were all devout to a degree, but we almost never talked about our religions with each other. Often someone would announce at the table that they couldn't eat a certain food or any food at all for a period of time, and we knew that religion hovered behind this, but no one ever offered an explanation other than, my mom said. And nobody ever asked for one. He says that that silent pact relieved all of us. We were not equipped with a language that allowed us to explain our faith to others or to know anyone else's faith. And he says, back then, I didn't really think about it. But a few years after they graduated, he says, my Jewish friend reminded me of a rather difficult time. There were a group of kids in the high school who for several weeks took up scrawling anti-Semitic slurs on classroom desks and making obscene statements about Jews in the hallways. And Ibu says, I did not confront them and I did not comfort my Jewish friend. I knew little about what Judaism meant to him, less about the emotional effects of anti-Semitism, and next to nothing about how to stop religious bigotry. And so Ibu says, I averted my eyes and I avoided my friend because I couldn't stand to face him. And a few years later, Ibu says that that friend says to him, that what they experienced in those high school days meant that he felt utterly lonely because he had watched his friends stand by. And Ibu says that hearing him talk about those experiences and the complicity of his friends in those experiences made him feel like he not only betrayed his friends, but he betrayed his faith a betrayal of Islam which calls upon Muslims to be courageous and compassionate in the face of injustice, and a betrayal of America, a nation that relies on its citizens to hold up the bridges of pluralism when others try to destroy them. Ibu says, my friend needed more than my silence at that lunch table. It ne he needed me to know my faith, and to live my faith. You see, in this passage from Matthew, where they're waiting for the banquet, it's no time to fall asleep or to be complacent. But then, in the story, we have the announcement. And the announcement is, that the bridegroom is coming. And so everyone gets ready and the preparations are in full swing and they start getting their lamps, their oil lamps, and they start putting the oil in the lamps and oh, of course, only half of them have oil. 
And so the ones that have oil for their lamps say, well, y'all better go down the street and get got down to the dealer and get some more oil for your lamp. And so they go off. And what happens in the midst of while they're going off to get that oil because they weren't prepared, because they hadn't been paying attention? The bridegroom comes. And the bridegroom comes, and the bridegroom takes everyone who is there into the banquet, and they're celebrating, but they lock the door. And when those others who have been down at the dealership uh, trying to get their oil at the last minute come, the door is locked, and the bridegroom says, I don't know you. We are in the midst of this kind of do we have oil in our lamps or not? moment. We are in the midst of changes in our church in the North America. Changes in our church where uh, there are, is a losing influence of our uh, influence of congregations in our society. Less and less people are going to worship. And we wonder, is it because we're down buying oil at the dealership because we didn't prepare. It's like this is no time to be sending your sister back to your apartment to get the wedding rings in time for the wedding ceremony. Here we are, because we are gathered here for worship on this day. Because we are taking seriously that the oil is needed, that the preparations are needed. We are here, the gift of your congregation. You have written on your walls as you walk into this church building. We are love, challenged by Christ to serve all. We are in the midst of those preparations with that oil for our lamps. We need to be about that preparation. And we need to be about leaders who can um, lead in the midst of this kind of complicated and complex and changing world. And I will say that I am very uh, pleased to be at Eden Seminary in these days. I am an alum of Eden and so have come back. Um, it is a time in the seminary's life when we are undergoing also lots and lots of changes. We have gone from a school where everyone needs to be on the campus physically to be able to attend the school to a blended model of classrooms that are on campus and online with degrees now fully accredited so that anyone can be a fully engaged student from wherever we are. We've been talking about that. We are Eden everywhere we are. Because it's not just about being able to be in the classroom, and it's not just being able to have access to that kind of theological education, but it's also the preparation and the depth to be able to lead in these complex times. We've been doing some videos uh, for the seminary and had the opportunity to speak with faculty and staff and some of our alumni for these videos. And in one of those videos that's on the website, eden.edu, uh, Lauren Buck talks about her experience. And she says, the ways in which I read and interpreted the Bible and applied it to my life before didn't always serve me well because I couldn't question it. I couldn't disagree with it. And so my growth has been able to help me do just that. To be able to question our faith, to be able to question our stories so that we can go deeper, so that we can know God where God is in the midst of the complexity of our lives and our world to be able to be prepared, to be God's servants, and to join God in this work in the world that is creating this banquet. 
said that we were here in uh, this area and uh, in the upcoming days I'll be at Lakeland University and uh, visiting with leaders there about uh, plans for how Eden and Lakeland uh, as well as other uh, colleges around the country can come closer to each other. Maybe there'll be some uh, academic programming that we can do together. We don't know what it will look like. But one of the things that we've been doing at Eden is not only making it more accessible for people to join, but to widen the scope of who imagines themselves as part of theological education. Who imagines themselves as part of the preparation of the oil in our lamps? And so uh, we have been embarking on what we call the network model of theological education. And we've been uh, developing joint uh, shared courses and faculty sharing with other theological seminaries so that students can have a broader range of courses available. We've been doing this joint work with not only Lakeland, but other colleges to see if there are ways to spark imagination in students that no matter what profession you're in, you are in leadership um, and have the potential to put your faith into action. And the network model also cooperates with uh, the United Church of Christ committees on ministry that are authorizing uh, pastors and leaders for the church. What is it that is needed for leadership in our churches and how can the seminary come alongside that in even more powerful ways? It feels like this moment when the bridesmaids are there and being invited into that banquet with the bridegroom. We are about, all of us, are about being part of God's body in the world. And the world needs us to be about that preparation and paying attention. We've started a uh, social media campaign for trying to attract new students to the seminary, and we've called it What the World Needs, and Are You Ready for the World? This is not just the seminary. This is our congregations. These are our communities of faith. What the world needs is grace. What the world needs are thinkers, are theologians, what the world needs is care. What the world needs is transformation, faith, vision, solidarity, love, respect. It's a bit like making sure that we have the wedding rings in time for that all-important ceremony. So Matthew tells us to keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. May we keep practicing. May we keep preparing. And may we be sure that like the kids have reminded us, we need sustenance for that journey. We need food for that journey. And we need to be prepared. So keep on going, keep on loving, Keep on serving. You are God's people in the world. Amen. Please pray with me. Still speaking, God, each week as we gather, we look forward, wondering what the week ahead will bring. Some of us are anticipating the joy of the next few weeks gathering our families together, preparing food and celebrations, and our hearts fill with hope. And some of us are feeling the ache that comes with the anticipation of loved ones who are no longer with us, of relationships that are strained, and the uncertainty that comes with being human. We hold on to our faith, thankful that you are with us each day. Lord, bring your healing to Arlen Collin, Sue Erdman, Helen Ergen, Jerry Henschel, 
Jessica Hornick, Jen Yashib, Kathy Robb, Dorothy Schnell, Joan Schufner, Jessica Summers, and George Valeski. We grieve alongside Lori Borneman's family. We recognize in our grief the longing for hope, trusting that death is not the end of the story. Yet even so, the ache of missing loved ones remains. Help us wait with people. For those who are waiting for healing that comes one day at a time, for those who are waiting for appointments, surgeries, phone calls from others, we long for instantaneous results, and waiting is frustrating. So we talk with you, God, giving to you all the things we are holding and waiting for. We give thanks for our veterans who serve our country. Be with them and keep them safe as they serve. Be near people who are living in countries that are in war. Holy Spirit, move through peacemakers who provide food, shelter, education, and hope in times such as these. Bless the people who are working in food service, retail workers, educators, working on extra holiday events, and people everywhere that are preparing. May we treat one another with kindness, patience, recognizing in one another your presence, O God, a piece of the image of God before us. Hear us as together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing our next hymn. We will tell each generation. It's on page six of your bulletin. like the bridesmaids in the story, waiting for Jesus to come again, unsure of when that will be. However, we give thanks for the preparation of faithful ancestors who came together to be the church in their time in history, building our foundation. From them, we see the gift of community, recognizing that we can do far more good together than we can independently. 
As our offerings are brought forward, let us give thanks for the ministry we do together as we give our time, talents, and treasure and sing our doxology. participate in your work of love in the world, giving us all that we need to follow your lead. Help us be generous with our time, hearts, minds, and hands as you are. Accept our offerings as a sign of our participation in gratitude for your unending love. Guide us as we continue on our journeys. Amen. In our church, we have a tradition called the Alleluia Benediction. We sing together the first verse, and the words are Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And the second time, I am sorry. Can you sing? The second time, we come, and I do a benediction. All right. justice, honor everyone, love and serve God, rejoicing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit among us, and may the blessings of God among us, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with you now and forevermore. <laughs> 